you everybody for coming. I'm Matthew Burgess. I'm the manager here at Tarata Galleries. And um, I'd like to welcome you all to this panel discussion as part of Russian Art Week. So we're looking at the contemporary side of Russian art as opposed to the auction things that are happening this week. I know there's some contemporary elements there, but um, we specialise in contemporary Russian art and we're very interested in the future of contemporary Russian art from the Arati Museum based in St. Petersburg. So it's a lovely panel of uh, people here, experts if you will. We've got some uh, lovely Theodore and Clark and she'll introduce everybody um, here. Thank you very much for coming everybody. So. Please uh, sit and enjoy. If you'd like to have yourself for refreshments during the, the talk, then please do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to Matthew and Arata Galleries for hosting us this morning. Um, this is actually our final event in the Russian Art Week programme in London. Um, I know many of you have been going to the Russian sales and various other events for the last seven days. Um, so we thought we'd finish with an event on contemporary art. So in fact, yesterday we held a very different event at the Victoria and Albert Museum, also on curating Russian art but looking at kind of the museum context, historical shows with the curators at the v &A, at the Courtauld Institute and at the Science Museum. So this is kind of the second part, if you like, of that discussion on curating Russian art. And I'm going to introduce each of our speakers here this morning. Um, first of all, on my far left, I have Anna Lipskaya, who has a degree from Moscow State University and the Sotheby's Institute of Art. For the last four years, she's been heading research and publication activity at Skates Art Market Research in New York, and she currently works for the private London-based valuation and advisory firm, Ger Johns, advising private and institutional clients. And then on my far left, I have Margarita Trushina, who is a contemporary Russian artist living in London with the experience of exhibiting internationally, including the fifth Moscow Biennale and the summer show at the Royal Academy in London. She's an international artist working between London and Moscow will be exhibiting here at Arata Galleries in London in early 2015. Then on my right I have Sasha, who is fresh from Maxine Boxer's exhibition and auction on metaphysics in Russian art, is held this week in London. Sasha is a freelance curator between London and Moscow, currently studying for her PhD. She's worked on many projects, including the V&A, the National Contemporary Art Centre in Moscow, and the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. And she also writes for Garage Magazine. And last but not least, on my far right is Polina Zakharova, who is the gallery director at Arata Galleries in St. Petersburg from 2012 to 2014. She's organised dozens of exhibitions of contemporary art and was also present in St. Petersburg in the lead up to Manifesto 10 and helped to seek out a number of emerging contemporary artists to exhibit. So apologies for the very long introductions, but I think you can very clearly see that they're all experts and absolutely right for today. Um, my name's Theodore Clark. I edit at RussianArtAndCulture.com, which is now the world's leading platform for Russian culture events. And we also publish the guide to Russian Art Week. Um, and I wanted to kick off with talking about three things. I want to talk about Russian Art Week in London, um, UK Russia, Year of Culture. Now it's towards the end of the year and then to pick up with Manifesta before I hand over to our other speakers. And the Russian Art Week results, we've actually just added up all of the auction house totals from yesterday when we had the last sales at McDougal's and Bonhams. And I'm afraid to say that actually the Russian ruble falling and the effect of economic sanctions has actually had quite a big dent on the sales. Um, in fact, last Friday, Russian Art and Culture published the first major report on the Russian art market and we looked at all of the auction houses and we looked at the different market shares for icons versus works of art like Fabergé versus contemporary versus avant-garde painting. Um, and actually what we've discovered is that, just looking at my results today, the total sales for this week were 45 million, which is down 37% on Russian Art Week in the summer. So that's actually a significant dip. Um, however, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there were over five works which did sell for over a million pounds and of course Christie set a new record this week with the Valentin Serov 1910 painting with the portrait of Maria Zetlin which fetched 9.2 million and that's actually a record now for a new Russian painting and a Russian art sale. And very interestingly as well, Sotheby's have been the market leader now for many years for Russian Art Week but for the first time Christie's have actually overtaken Sotheby's um, for the first time this week in their sale results. So it's interesting to see also how contemporary art fits into Russian Art Week. 
And two of the trends that we identified in our report is first of all that icon markets has been rapidly declining now for several years, but also that contemporary art has only been making up 10% of the Russian Art Week sales. And in fact, for this Russian Art Week, it was only 5%. So actually a very small amount is being sold in the contemporary sphere. It's really the focus is on 19th century and early 20th century avant-garde with the great artists like Rurik or um, Custodia Shishkin. These are the artists who are really setting the major records. It's not all doom and gloom. In fact, um, on my right with Sasha, who of course was working for Maxine Boxer, I'm sure you'll talk a bit more about your sale in a moment. Um, but actually they did very well as a smaller auction held here in Arata. I'm sure you can give us the, the facts and figures for your sale a bit later on. But it's interesting to see the results of Russian Art Week, that actually there are a few major paintings with strong provenance, good exhibition history, which are really museum quality paintings. And they are setting the, the top prices, which perhaps are masking what's happening lower down the market, where actually a lot of works were brought in. And for example, at the Sotheby's evening sale on Monday, where nearly three quarters of the pictures didn't actually sell. So you've got kind of top paintings at the top of the market, we're really setting the records and actually lower down the scale those pictures are not necessarily selling at auction so we'll wait to see if that's a trend that continues in 2015. And I also wanted to touch on the UK Russia year of culture because it's now we'll see nearly the end of the year in December next month and in fact last week there was a major conference that the Victorian Albert Museum hosted um, and they flew over in fact the Minister Shvitkoy from Russia has very much kind of spearheaded the UK-Russia Year of Culture programme along with the British Council. And he made a very astute point, quite a bold, provocative statement in fact, at the V&A. And he stood up and said, you know, I'm here as a Russian Minister of Culture, I've been invited by a national British museum, and in the room today there is nobody here from the British Council, from the Foreign Office, from the UK Government. And to me that's an incredibly sad moment, because I actually think that cultural diplomacy particularly in the light of the current situation with Ukraine and Russia, is even more important. That's really the, the purpose of the talk today, is to look at the legacy of Manifesta, but also I think the legacy of the UK-Russia Year of Culture, and actually what have we achieved in the last 12 months. And yes, politically it might be quite difficult and quite sensitive, but actually if you look at the relationships which have been built up between individuals and institutions, I think actually we have a huge amount to be proud of. I think the VNA is a great example of that. I know the director, Martin Roth, has now done several Russian exhibitions. They actually arranged for Russian curators to come to London to actually see works in the collections. And they have a reciprocal programme with the Kremlin, with the Hermitage, and other major national institutions in Russia. So I'm hoping there will be this sort of continuation of cultural exchange between the two countries. There have also been some major challenges. Um, I know of two major exhibitions in the last year which were actually cancelled um, due to, I presume, a lack of funding due to the political situation. And the Royal Academy was scheduled to have an ASNF exhibition in the autumn, and of course the Young British Artists exhibition at the Ekaterina Foundation in Moscow was also cancelled. So there were two very big high-profile events with British Council support. So that's why I think galleries like Arata in London, um, like the institutions like Christie's and Sotheby's are very important because actually if those government funded exhibitions are not going ahead as smaller organisations in London we have a big responsibility I think to continue that. And last I wanted to touch on Manifesta and I've actually just been to St Petersburg for the closing party of Manifesta um, and I had a tour with Dmitry Ozakov and I was very impressed with what they had tried to do but I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the European Biennale, it's now been going for about 20 years. It's of course a roving Biennale which chooses different um, cities in Europe. You could argue whether Russia is part of Europe, that's a, another argument for another day. Um, but it's actually the first time that Russia have hosted the contemporary European Biennale. We had over 55 artists who participated in the programme with more than 35 new works which were specifically commissioned. And I had two sort of main observations about my time in Russia, um, obviously as a British journalist going to see a, a Russian cultural project. And the first thing was that actually Manifesta is always displayed as being this major event at the Hermitage, the State National Museum in St. Petersburg. Of course, it's very much been given a huge amount of state support in order to be at the Hermitage. 
I actually looked up the visitor figures for you this morning and between the 28th of June and the 15th of October, 1.2 million people visited the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. And obviously a huge amount of that will be the normal international tourists who very much go there as part of the tourist trail. But I wonder if any of you know how many people visited the General Staff Building, which is actually where the majority of the manifesto events were held. So it was 1.2 million at the Winter Palace, but I'm afraid only 80,000 people in that entire six month period actually made it to the General Staff Building. And that made me think about the reason for that. And actually, I think contemporary art is still very much a new concept in Russia. Um, obviously, we're sitting here in London, and London has literally thousands of galleries just in this one city. And across the UK, we're very used to seeing contemporary art. We have major museums like Tate Modern, the White Cube Gallery. But actually, Russia doesn't have the same history, if you like, of contemporary spaces. Um, I remember when I was in St. Petersburg, of course, got Arata, Contemporary Art Museum, Ananova, interesting projects coming out, such as New Holland, which is one of Dasha Zhukova's new projects. So I think almost one of the legacies of Manifesto is this was the first major contemporary art event which Russia had ever hosted. And it's actually really kind of challenged, I think, the Russian public and really introduce them to quite provocative artworks which maybe wouldn't have been exhibited in these major national museums. And I always think that when you go to Russia, St. Petersburg is always advertised as this major space where you go to visit really the palaces of the Tsars. You know, most people would go to the Winter Palace, they'd go to Peterhof, Pavlovsk. But maybe the real legacy of Manifesto is that in 10, 15 years time, you're actually going to St. Petersburg as a contemporary art destination when places like New Holland have opened, which I believe is not until 2020, so a very long um, time away. So that's really all I wanted to say, and I just wanted to sort of think about this question, really for the whole panel, of what is the legacy of Manifesto? Is it actually um, confronting and thinking about these questions of modern art and contemporary art in a new context where contemporary art is still quite unknown, I think, to the average Russian public? Um, but also we need to think about the questions of the political context and actually how important is culture in the very specific time that we're working at the moment with the background of the Ukraine and Russia crisis. So I'm actually very optimistic and that's why I run the Russian Art Culture website because I do think Russia has an enormous history, very unique tradition and actually it's something that should be showcased to the world. And I just hope that all of us sitting in this room who work on various Russian cultural projects and continue to do our bit to be the cultural diplomats, if you like, of the future, to continue the legacy of the projects. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, and I think our next speaker, I'm going to hand over to Anna Lipskaya, um, who's going to talk, I think, a bit about um, the market and valuation of Russian contemporary art. Well, I just want to say thank you, Theodora, for this wonderful coverage of the manifesto. I attended it as well. And um, as I say, Petersburg, born person for me, it was a, such a pleasure to see um, these installations in the main building and uh, new contemporary art juxtaposed juxtapo with old masters, finally, and also the general staff building was filled with high quality installations, uh, completely equal to all the art fairs and finales we see all over the world. And also, it was very satisfying to see the small St. Petersburg courtyards filled with dialogues of contemporary artists. It was absolutely brilliant. But um, the question asked to us, the Matthew Burgess was about valuation of contemporary Russian art and how to set up the market for contemporary Russian art. Uh, when I was thinking about this question, it reminded me of a story. Around four years ago, I went to St. Petersburg and I met one of my, um, one of my childhood friends who finished uh, St. Petersburg University and a very successful lawyer right now. And she asked me what I do right now and I said that I'm in the art world. And she told me that, oh, there's a small uh, art building that opened just at the side of the city. Do you want to have a look? And we went there and we saw this huge building with a message on top saying Irata. And we went inside and it was completely empty. It was a floor, five floor building filled with beautiful contemporary art. And there was absolutely no one inside. And there were bookstores filled with Russian books about art, Tashin books that I think could not be found anywhere else in the city. And it was absolutely amazing to see that there was no one, and uh, no one knows about this. 
So I think that instead of asking the question how to value Russian contemporary art and how to set up the market for the Russian contemporary art and valuation system, I think for now there's hardly any market to value, any market to look at in terms of Russian contemporary art. And one of the reasons for that I think is ignorance, ignorance of general public about this really big event happening about this first huge contemporary Russian museum opening in St. Petersburg, but no one knowing about that. I'm sure right now if we go there, there will be public uh, visiting the, and looking at the artists and reading about this. But back then, I didn't pay much attention to that. And now I see that there was no market back then, and right now hardly anything changed. Uh, we, also asked, uh, we also thought about the political situation right now. I think the political situation hardly changes anything. It's probably not making anything better, but I, I don't see that there was any market for contemporary art before. And this is, if anything, I think it gives more opportunities for artists to reflect on Russian situation. But in terms of pricing, I don't think it changes much. And um, I think one of the things to look at, one of the things to change the situation is to look at the education and not at an education from the perspective of museum, of research for people who are uh, right now in our generation, but I think we have to look a little bit behind, uh, a little bit forward, and to draw our attention to children who are going to be educated at the, at the beginning of their school. I think the appropriate age here is four or five years old when they just start to uh, look, when they start to read, look at art, and um, memorize the artist's names. I think it's very important to start the education from that age and draw the attention to art, to new contemporary names names of the artists of our generation and to try and attempt to focus their attention on the ways this contemporary artists can change their lives, can contribute something emotionally, physically and um, by that I think growing up they will see that art actually is an important, uh, important factor of our lives and not just the thing that we draw attention after we achieved everything else because for now I think that in our generation, in the general public, art is not considered as something vital in our, in our daily lives. For now, instead of um, paying uh, attention to art, we go to shops, we go to theater, we don't go to museums and to galleries that much. And that is the reason why we don't, why we don't support our Russian contemporary art. I think the ignorance and the lack of education from the early age and uh, to build the contemporary Russian market it's important to support it through various ways, through going to museums and galleries, and then to uh, invest in it financially. So I think that's one of the reasons. Excellent. And um, actually, you just mentioned there about the market. Can I just jump in with a question, and then I'll go on to the next speakers. And um, I know Art Moscow has obviously been happening every two years, but for the first time, it's actually not happening this year. Is that because there's just a lack of buyers of contemporary artists in Russia? Well, it's definitely one of the reasons. I think that this whole political situation right now it draws people's attention away from art. Art in, in, in Moscow right now is probably one of the last things that people are thinking about. It's very important to solve the situation and then go back to the art market. Otherwise, I don't think that anything can be changed for now. To, to think about. It was never the first thing to think about. It was now people just don't need it. Okay, excellent. Fantastic. And, and the second one I'd like to hand over to Sasha Birkenova. <coughs> Uh, yes, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so basically, yes, uh, as Theodora mentioned, uh, I worked uh, this time for Nissan Boxer Exhibition and Auctions and uh, helped him mostly on uh, organizing the, uh, the academical part of the program, which at the first auction didn't have. Uh, my background is basically in like, public art rather than Russian uh, like, art market. So this kind of like, predefines my view on things. Um, what I kind of like found really fascinating is uh, that the, the community like uh, I started working with like uh, first of all like when I arrived uh, to London I arrived like to study art and then I started working from here so people artists with whom I started working with they're basically like this flock of uh, Western educated uh, like people who work for, with art which kind of really changes the point of view you have on things because it really makes you a bit more idealistic about things which are happening in your own country than you're outside. Then for those who, had, who got to the education, like being in Russia. 
uh, I would say like the, the second category is much more critical and uh, less inspired about the future and that they can actually change something about their country. Whereas like when you get education here, like first of all you come with the idea that uh, you just don't want to associate yourself like as a Russian art practitioner. You want to kind of come here, learn, and then like after a while you start remembering that actually you are a Russian and uh, you have like some things like somehow like on your unconscious level that kind of start coming up somehow in your work. But the aesthetic is really kind of getting predefined with what's happening here, like in Western education, like in Western like art thinking. Uh, so this was a really interesting moment to start with, like working here. Because then like after I did several shows uh, in London, I started doing shows for Moscow. And again, people were really uh, let's say critical to me because of this sort of idealism. You come like as if you are like Western as art practitioner and you try to do something like on the Russian like art market, like art, Russian art scene, like who you are to be here, right? Uh, but this kind of like again made you think about how you can actually uh, connect these people, how you can make this dialogue between like yeah the locals and the locals who created like for education uh, and. Uh, as you, like, you also start comparing, comparing like, how things work here and how they start working like, in Russia. Again, as I said, like, I started with public art. So most uh, institutions uh, of, like, uh, which came from my previous practice, they're not galleries, but rather project spaces and museums. Uh, and I'm really happy like, uh, to say that uh, this like, last year, like, about 17 new project spaces opened uh, in Moscow. Basically what uh, the government did, they uh, took the old, uh, forgotten, abandoned uh, exhibition spaces, which were, like, let's say, like Soviet-style exhibition spaces. Uh, and they sponsored them, they funded them uh, to make exhibitions like uh, once a month. Uh, and so they invited like really young people to work there, like those who actually like, started from this, let's say, like Russian art uh, to Sofka, like uh, this community of people who are like really close friends, uh, which was really important because these people, as you understand, they start not from the artworks themselves, like, just like, thinking about what's there. But they started from, you know, like drinking with artists, thinking with artists, basically producing ideas with artists. And that I found like really fascinated that uh, people actually allowed this flock of like really close to artist people to actually decide what will be in their galleries. But here came the second trouble, because the people who give money to make the shows are not from this flock. They're like, as you understand, they're like from government. Uh, and here I had like some, uh, some really kind of strange situations. Because basically, when you write a proposal for a project space in Russia, you kind of, as you know, like as Bulgakov did in his times, you write uh, something in a form that you can deliver to the government, but only those who can read between lines can actually see what you want to say through this show. Uh, for example, uh, like one project which didn't work, and so uh, this was my first experience, which kind of like taught me what I did wrong. Um, we, uh, we, propo like, we proposed uh, a text uh, and exhibition uh, with the uh, Russian uh, artist and photographer Artem, um, Artem Bo, and the project was about Crimea. What I actually loved about this project was that uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, like uh, the point of view on who is wrong, who is right in this conflict, but it was the experience of a person who also works as a uh, like photojournalist for Forbes. It was experience of actually getting on the territory of the country in conflict and uh, kind of like as an artist at that point to perceive like uh, how much the attitude to, on the personal level changes uh, from the country when they know that you're a Russian, Russian young man who is, you know, can do something better to them. Uh, this project, uh, uh, it was confirmed first uh, because uh, like the, again, as I said, like the team who is uh, doing the curatorial uh, things in the project space, they're like really young, they love the idea, they thought it's like really something we would like to share, so it was confirmed. But then when it came to funding, uh, the project was not even like read because they saw this word, you know, like Crimea, no, we don't want to deal with this, whatever it is about. Uh, so for future like things I was doing with uh, all these like project spaces, uh, we kind of made this, uh, yeah, like a little trick that you first write a proposal, which is basically uh, about uh, what you will see in the show, but what you are going to tell in the show, you don't really kind of expand on that. Because this is like for those who will come, because, for, so forgive me for these words, but the people who give you money, they don't really come to your openings. They don't care. They just need, like, you know, like these tick boxes that we have young curators, young artists shown. Done. Uh, 
Also, like uh, speaking about the difficulties uh, again, like speaking about the comparing, uh, comparing the practice curating like here and curating back to Russia. Uh, what I found also like very unfair is uh, that when you do a show in uh, Russia, people really like to bring artists who are like Russians and Western educated. They love Western artists. It's really get like easy to get money for that. But uh, if I start speaking, uh, thinking about I want to take like Russian emerging artists and show it here. Here comes the trouble, because again, maybe it's my lack of experience or research, but I didn't find uh, many places where you can actually, like, from the Ministry, Ministry of Culture, you can get money for taking Russian artists and bringing him here. Not even money, not even like a place. I mean, of course, we know that like, private, uh, we know that like, Pushkin House. Uh, a right is a bit different story, because I mean, you guys need to sell. It's like next step. Yeah, because we need to support our museum as well. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, we are part of a non-profit project and we have our galleries to support, from a commercial side, of course, as a gallery. But we try to support our museum as well, so... But this, like, this, this step, which uh, is really important, it's really lacking here now, I, uh, I feel, that, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, kind of easy. Uh, you go to your school or you do your practice, you start building yourself as a like, art practitioner, then you go to like project space, uh, you represent yourself there, like you, oh, like you open yourself to the world, people come there from the galleries, they notice you, they took you to the gallery. Uh, this second step is really under, like, underdeveloped like in our country, because again, people who go to uh, project spaces, they're friends of the friends of the friends of the friends. We don't meet like uh, many, you know, like galleries there. We don't meet like any people who, you know, say like, you're really cool, I want to take you like to London, let's say, yeah, and to kind of ask you to represent my country. Um, and it was like really great to work with Maxim for this project, for example, this uh, second auction, uh, because uh, basically what he allowed to do, to, he allowed me to do, was to try and make like this uh, testing ground, like where you can actually bring acad academic, academics uh, from Russia to speak about what's on the walls, to bring artists to speak like what's on the art, what's behind like the artworks, uh, and to invite like, people, international people and uh, local Russians to kind of come and uh, hear what's happening. It was success. Thank you. Quite a lot of people. Uh, and yes, and uh, to my mind, it really worked well because uh, so many people, like uh, who came both like to the talks uh, and uh, to the auction itself, uh, they said it really kind of helped them to appreciate uh, the artworks. Because uh, the other way of like criticizing the auction was uh, that uh, people who came there, like internationals, they came there and they really enjoyed what they see on the walls, but they were really unsure about actually getting something this time because they don't know the names, they don't know who they're buying, the countries, they don't want to, you know, like just waste money on something they don't know about. Uh, so even we sold like 68% of our things, which is like 40 artworks out of 59, which is great results, because we don't need to take them home and pay for transportation anymore. <laughs> it's good. Uh, but yes, uh, the pricing was a bit uh, lower than we expected. And again, the reason was that uh, it's good that uh, when you have like at least you know like at least two people fighting for one artwork, it kind of builds the price. But for most of the works, we had like uh, one people like who those you know like I know the artist, I love the artist, I want to take this home, and they were mostly Russians, as you understand. So I think next time we also will have opportunity to expand this like academical block in our auction uh, and bring more young artists because. Uh, if you read the catalog and saw the show, but you know that the third part uh, was uh, dedicated to uh, emerging artists and like, those who are like, recently graduated, which to my mind was like least uh, developed uh, part in our exhibition and auction. Obviously, like, you don't, I don't need to explain why, because like, we want to be safe too, because we need to kind of somehow like, cover our expenses. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is like, a great opportunity to at least like, try somehow bring money to those who are back to Russia and they don't really get like anything from all what's happening in the art world, we say, here. Uh, and last thing like, I would like to say on that is uh, uh, basically about this idea of like, being contemporary Russian artist. I have like, lots of uh, troubles with the way how this phrase is put. What is it like to be a contemporary Russian artist? What is, it, what is it like to be a contemporary American artist, compared to contemporary Korean artist? Does it change a lot? So maybe we can talk about it later.
Thank you. Good question. Okay, fantastic. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Margarita Trushina. Yeah, so actually, in, in this panel discussion, I think I'm representing this contemporary Russian <laughs> artist, which is really actually difficult to define and to explain what's actually the difference between, you know, be, being a contemporary Russian artist or just being a Russian, or just being a Russian or contemporary artist. So I will uh, I will tell just about my personal experience and. Um, so I, I started to study art in, in Moscow and it was in 2006 Then I went to school, um, it's, it's called Contemporary uh, Institute of Contemporary Art in Moscow, which was headed by uh, Joseph Bachstein. And um, so what I saw there, that is, um, um, there is no like a proper educational system in Russia for contemporary art, unfortunately. And so I spent there two years and there was like a few lectures uh, and, and several seminars during, during our study. But then I just realized that I, I actually can't find any sources for, you know, for being an artist, for, you know, to develop, to develop my career. And then I went to London to obtain my master's degree in fine arts and I went to study to Chelsea College of Art. And, um, you know, all Russian people, all Russian students, what they expect from, from the educational system, they expect that you actually will be taught, that someone will come and tell you what you need to do to become an artist. But uh, then you come in L to, to London and you start to study here, you just realize that that's the only thing that they will never do. What they do, they just, you know, they just give you an opportunity to do what you want. And that makes such a big difference. Um, for, for people, and I think that's the major problem for Russian, uh, for Russian educational system for contemporary art, that actually, you know, people just need to, to do what they want and they don't have an opportunity. Now I'm here in London for seven years and uh, I know that in Russia the situation has changed, that now there are like, quite a few schools, schools for, contemporary Russian, uh, for contemporary art, and one of them uh, is headed by uh, Olga Sikola, <coughs> at uh, Multimedia Art Museum and there's a few others which are connected to the to other museums. And that makes a little bit difference that people can now, you know, study and can read some books and also garage they open a beautiful library so then you can go and, and do your research. Um, what uh, about how to be a Russian artist in London? It's, it's quite tough because as uh, I think Theodore mentioned and Sasha that when you come to London, actually <clears throat> not many people here knows about Russian art, especially about contemporary art. I would say that nobody knows you know, contemporary Russian art. If you ask someone what you know about Russian uh, contemporary uh, Russian artists, they probably will, uh, will tell you that they know just Pussy Riot because <laughs> of the of the situation which you know which happened two years ago and here we go to another to another question of um, uh, how internationally people re uh, recognize contemporary art and what makes what makes it work, what what makes people to speak about con contemporary Russian art um, so yeah if you just you know look at the press for uh, several years you will just find them um, you will just find uh, lots of articles and a lot and lots of I don't know TV programs about Pussy Riot, and um, I think the the reason for this it's uh, it's a, actually it's it's not the, the Russian art itself; it's a political situation in Russia. And what makes people speak about art? It's it's a conflict with the government, which is really sad. Um, because then you speak about contemporary American artists, or I don't know French artists, or, or English artists. You never you know you never speak about them as a you know as a uh, contradiction or confrontation with the government. Um, so, so when you study art in London as a, as a you know as a Russian student, basically the first year or first two years you want to actually forget that you are Russian because you just want to be an artist, you just want to do something, and you don't want to you know think about all these bad things that happenings in that country. But anyway. You know, you have your identity, and anyway, you will come back to to some point. And in some works, which is, you know, it can be really abstract works or something. Anyway, you can underline the problems which is existing in the contemporary Russian society. So, um, 
There is a question if um, any recent political situation in Russia helping to create an internationally interesting contemporary artist for respond. I think it's very tough actually uh, for Russian artists to make a response for what's happening because the situation is now that people, the young Russian artists, they are sitting in their studios, they are doing their works and there is no art market, art, art market in Russia. So people who buy Russian art, they normally buy art from, you know, from, like they buy big names. They buy names which are, you can recognize, but for young Russian art, actually no one buys. And that's really sad. Um, there are a few, uh, like, there are a few activists who are actually trying to support Russian artists and to make, to make their work recognizable and to sell their works. For example, Vladimir Ostrovenko, who is um, having Regina Gallery, he organized Vladie, uh, it's like a small auction in Moscow, and they normally invite in like maybe one third of all the concert artists, they invite Russian uh, young artists, and they work um, sell quite well, but there is no practice that you can actually go to the gallery for the opening of young Russian artists and somebody buys work. I don't know. I think it's maybe it happens, but it's, it's not really often happens. And in London, if you are Russian young artist, you have a challenge to challenge to uh, like, to make your to make your work shown, to make your work sell. But here you're in the same position as actually as any other artist. You're in the same position as an as an American artist or African artist. It doesn't matter. You're just an artist, and you're just making your work, which is I think yeah, it's a healthy situation. And thank you for everyone who is you know who supports Russian art and Russian artists and make things easier for us. Thank you. Thank you, Marita. Uh, and last but not least, I'm going to introduce Polina Zakharov from Eros Galleries. Thank you so much for coming. And I really appreciate that you all came here and spent your morning with us and yeah, raising these questions. There's actually one question I want to ask you guys. Um, are you, who is buying art here? Just raise your hand. Who is buying contemporary art? <coughs> and now who is buying Russian contemporary art? <laughs> you wow. see, the thing is that we are here, but in the, I would say, around like, 40 people, and only four or five buying Russian contemporary art. And that's just a problem. Like, I, will, I want to ask you, because this is a major question, why are you not buying up Russian art? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. Is it because it's not really available here? I mean, of course, there's a Rasa here, but it's not. It's not like you see a lot of Russian art around. I studied art in Russia. Yeah. So cool. Any Russian person? Yeah. Sorry. I, obviously, I have a bit of insight, but I think it's having trust in the names, and um, I think for me, Britain, I think people, people, the average British person will know four or five contemporary artists that they know if they invest in, they can get. Exactly, that's basically my issue, in, because I, I have an interesting story to tell you, as I, um, I used to be a gallery director for Rata Galleries for a few years, and then um, became this representative of, uh, of Rata and Worldwide. But the thing is that people, and I, and I saw that people not buying, and I'm always asking questions, why are you not buying, what's the problem? Because Basically, I was in this project, which is not for profit, it's a museum, about it. it's not for profit, but at the same time we have gallery, commercial galleries supporting our work. And I was, I'm always asking them, if you, if you came to the gallery, if you came to the museum, so you must be interested, it's not about only not trusting, but what, what's wrong with it? And some people are telling me that, um, you know, we do not trust because there is no investment point, first of all, and we just don't like it. When people say that they don't like it, that means that they do not know it. And as we, as we were talking and this panel was going on, we, I think that we might come to the point that we all 
agree that there is no educational system or in Russia in terms of um, um, contemporary Russian art or Russian art. We used to have, um, back in times before the revolution, uh, people used to collect and we, Russian, um, Russia, Russia has um, massive collections of um, 19th century uh, artworks because people knew how to collect, they knew how what to buy and how to support the artists. Now they unfortunately we lost this connection and we don't have any opportunity to we do have but it's very limited. And um, the question is what is um, uh, written here is uh, how how can this be changed? Uh, which galleries and curators making steps towards a reliable Russian market? I mean, first of all, I think it's um, the lack of governmental support, well, obviously, like manifesto, for example, as we're talking about manifesto as well. Um, um, well, most of people, they didn't even know that manifesto is going on in, in, in St. Petersburg. Like, my family is not connected with art. Well, it's now connected because I am in the art scene. But when I call my family saying like, I'm coming to St. Petersburg, they would be like, why are, you, why are you coming? I'm like, it's manifest of that. And my dad, who is um, 55 years old, and he's buying art now because of me, because I turn him into this point saying like, look, this is art, and you, you have to appreciate it. He would be like, oh yeah, I heard something. My dad saying it, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is a man who is actually now looking a bit in, in, into um, contemporary art. I think this, this is the problem that um, there's no a proper, there is support, but it's not in the scale that Russia can actually do. But I think um, here is the point that we need to. Um, wave our hands and say like, guys, we're here. It's not about like, this is the feature of Russian, Russian people. They all try to blame everything on government and say like, yeah, they, they are all to blame. No, we need to, all the, um, what I think is a problem as well, that galleries and artists and curators and people who are in art and teachers, they are not to, together now. If they come all together saying like, look, uh, we need to build up the market, like galleries would not be competing all the time. They will be competing afterwards when they kind of build the market, but they, they more look into separate and individual um, return and they are not looking into building up the system for and saying, come to the government and say like, look, we're here, we're ready, we're strong enough and we want your support. Probably this is the problem as well. Um, Russia stands towards the development of contemporary art. Yeah, well, I mean, it's so many things that I'm thinking of why contemporary Russian art is not that valuable now. Um, and one point that I see is um, it's not fashionable. Um, there is, when, when something got really into fashion in Russia, everyone started buying it. And it's not only for Russia, but I mean, like bags and everything. It's people get crazy, but people do have money. But they not thinking of um, of um, having an artwork as a as a luxury thing. As I think, if you if you if you having an artwork, if you buy contemporary art, this is a raising your profile. And people do not um, look into it. And I think this um, this is a problem. Like who is. I do, I do write on Russian contemporary art sometimes, but I know that I can blame myself, first of all, not writing on it in terms of like super fashionable. Yes, I do have Instagram trying to put everything in it and every single like artwork and like Russian, not Russian. But if all Russians do this, people would turn like it will turn international curators as well to look into into art and see it from a different perspective. And. Um, a few points that I took, and um, yeah, we, in in terms of uh, a writer and uh, people who try to change um, markets and um, and try to change the situation in in Russia and the attitude, we had a massive problem. That's what uh, uh, Anya said. Uh, basically, we opened the project five years ago, and there was no people. There were like literally no people. People were not going there because they were kind of uh, afraid going there. And although 
because I think it's because of, of the situation with St. Petersburg. People see it as a very conservative and like hermitage Russian museum, but not as a scene for contemporary art. And um, then about uh, yeah, we, we had this like no people problem, but now it's quite good, and we we are the only. Um, museum that actually operate well we we're the only big institution that do that many pro programs and projects at the same time in St. Petersburg. So we are kind of make, became a center. But then we um, we got blamed for being very commercial and trying to people turn to us and say like look you have those shops and you know um, um, you try to print everything that you have while we try to just to um, educate people on art and okay we want some commercial revenue but um, in terms of what we're putting into it it's it is kind of a problem of education with what is we come to is education people try to play everyone to to do it to do it differently to do it and when when i, I when i hear that people say you know like errata is is very commercial i say Excuse me. Have you seen how many projects on educating people to do, and how how you how you actually can contribute to this project and and come to Avata and just participate in all these discussions and everything? I think it's the problem of raising the profile of, of Russian art, and it's actually the only thing that we can do all together. It's not about um, and it's first of all it's about like bringing it to children, and we have this large program and large project called Bibi Square where we had this uh, cartoon made on yeah, Bibi Square and Kandinsky Square for, for children and we need to start from, from children to, to raise the profile of, uh, of uh, contemporary art but at the same time um, I'm looking into, I do know a lot of people who are buying Russian contemporary art because I, yeah, well, I used to sell, I sell the, the Russian artworks but I know that there are lots of new collectors but we need a different approach to them. They they are traveling people. They are, you know, fun people. They um, ha they didn't have these uh, problems that um, um, an elder generation had, and they now quite ready to spend money on on art. But they want to. They see it as a very conservative thing to do. And um, yeah. I was just also thinking that it's, often, it's very important to ask the question why should we buy contemporary art? What are the reasons of our supporting our nationality in terms of art segment? Um, currently, I think that Russian contemporary artists, these are the people who raise the questions that disturb us, the questions that interest us, fascinates us, and we are the people who can understand that. It's like with contemporary literature, with contemporary theatre of Russia, we are the people who uh, understand it, who easily understand it. And if we don't support it, if we don't pay attention, if we don't take a special extra effort of reading about it, of understanding it and talking about it, then it has no chance of going abroad, of building the market abroad. So it's just the same as with, for example, Malevich Black Square. I'm sure that a majority of Russian people still don't understand the big, uh, Malevich Black Square and if we're still stuck in the 20th century, there's no chance of moving on. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of efforts of reading and researching about art. And that's what lots of people still, not, still don't understand. They think that art is only about the visual aspect. Yeah, it's but only at the about same time, there is no, uh, no one actually covering on Russian contemporary art. Who is covering on Russian contemporary art? It's another Russian issue. Music. It's another issue of research and academic research and artworks. I can see, for example, the Gozen Gallery spending a lot of time and financial sources of writing huge academic dissertations of the artists, of the, of the artworks they support. And um, I don't, unfortunately I don't see this happening in our country up until now, because it's a special aspect that needs to be... Yeah, and the, thing, the problem is that I see that people who are in arts, they try to be quite posh, you know, and there is um, a bit of a reluctance of our institution in terms of contemporary art, they turn away from it because they, they try to be like, they don't want a new place into it. And that's the problem with, uh, I think, with uh, at the same time, like, I, my first degree lies in uh, cross-cultural communication. And I see the problem in Russian society that we don't want to be connected with it in, in terms of like being a big and like, 
enjoy our country and love our country. I see the lack of interest to it. But when we turn to it, I think then our Russian artworks will be highly appreciated internationally. And when people come and say, like, yeah, I, I heard about Arata because um, a Russian person told me that I need to go there and have a look at it because you actually guys are not that Soviet Union. Like, excuse me? <laughs> people do see Russian Russian art as the um, as a step back to its, you know, like Soviet Union, but we are not Soviet Union anymore. We have a new emerging artists, new curators, new, and I think that we all need to put into this um, efforts into into promoting it. But at the same time, I see that um, you you talk about the public art, and I see this one of the ways to educate people and to to bring a new vision of art. To, to people, like uh, for example, I, I worked on a Polkovo, 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 Polkovo project, the new um, terminal um, airport, and we put those four leaders um, in different poses in, in, in the terminal. And you know, people respond, it was quite interesting to see people's responses. And, some, some, some people say that Russian society is not ready for, for art. It is very ready because we had so much feedbacks on it. We, if, you, if you look into, if you, you know, hashtag pull cover, all you see is those ladies. People like it, but at the same time they might not like it. But they, they have the feeling for it. So um, I think that people should now turn into promoting more of a public art. Because when you see this everywhere, and when you see, in London, you go and you see art everywhere, literally everywhere. In Russia, when you go out, you'll be like, oh my god, there's an artwork, what is it doing here? So it's, it's more of an amusement, like, what's that surprise? But when it come, when, if it will come to the point where, where people get accustomed to it, they will turn to it and they will, will invest in it and the market will, will, will raise. But, I think it's a, it's a, you can't blame anyone, you just can't blame yourself for not promoting Russian art enough. That's, that's what I want. Can I say something? Yes, of course. You promoting <laughs> Russian art. Uh, again, like from my background, yes. course, like my bachelor's are in sociology, so it kind of like makes you look yeah. at things in a way. When I come to a gallery, like, again, like after coming to a gallery for several times, you kind of you start realizing that actually you can spot American artists. They have like all this like you know the like, post-internet things happening. Like, if you speak about emerging artists, when you come like, to a gallery, you see something about uh, nature, culture, object-oriented anthology, speculative realism. You see like perhaps this is from London. This is like something it comes here from here. Korean artists, you can easily spot like Chinese. You can spot them. When I come like, to a gallery, I can't spot Russian artists. Like what is it? A contemporary Russian artist? Like are there like any? I think that this is an interesting point because we were quite and Russian artists were quite remote from the international scene for so so long during Soviet Union. They now try to get into everything, every sort of field. They try to. They don't have because I don't know British art. They have. Um, um, a long history behind it. We had this sort of underground history and um, now as young people, as young contemporary artists have the access to what's going on in the world, they have the access to the internet, they have the access to like, traveling, they try to do everything and I think it's a good point, it's, it's a good thing to do but now this is your turn for the curators to put it into the way and say like, look, this is not discovered everywhere in the world. This is your feature. This is very characteristic of all your... I'm trying to so, <laughs> it's really difficult. Well, I know it's not yeah. there anyway. Well, I know, I know it, but... Can I pick up on two points? And um, you've all raised the point about this lack of awareness of Russian art. And obviously I'm a Brit who works with Russian culture, which is quite unusual. In fact, Russian art culture did uh, an experiment the other day and I wanted to find out, like, sort of London population, how much they actually knew, like, the average man on the street outside Green Park Station, how much they know about Russian culture. And you first will ask them, you know, if I just say the words Russian culture to you, what's the first words that you'd associate with that? Um, and I'm afraid none of them picked art. Everybody either picked literature or music. And it was the really famous kind of uh, historical figures like Tolstoy, or it was Rimsky-Korsakov, or Tchaikovsky, Swan Lake. Um, but actually, no one picked uh, an artist. 
And then in my second question I said, well, if you had to pick a Russian artist, who would you name? And not one person could name a contemporary Russian artist. They all picked basically the three most famous avant-garde artists. So it would be either Kandinsky, Chagall or Malevich. They probably wouldn't have even known Malevich if it wasn't for the Tate exhibition <laughs> on at the moment. Um, which really ties up this point about a, a lack of awareness. And I was looking up the results for the sales of contemporary arts, and um, Sashi, you mentioned about your sale. And just looking at the results, you guys got um, £71,350, which actually is very good considering that they're at the other end of the market, so you know, not the million plus lots that I was talking about earlier. And then Sotheby's have had their second sale of contemporary Eastern art, and that got £1.1 million. Pounds. Um, but bearing in mind that the whole total for Russian Art Week was actually 40.5, you can see what an incredibly small proportion, basically one out of 40 million, is what's being spent on contemporary art. So I think the question is, how do we raise the profile of Russian culture internationally? And there's two things that come up from a different angle that you've all mentioned, and I think that's education, and it seems to be education of the artists, and education of the collectors, and making a buyer's market. Um, and Marguerite, I was really struck by your comment about you coming to London and how different the style of artist was. I remember when I went to Rata, several artists said to me that when you're in Russia, you go to the very academic style of training for maybe seven years, you're taught technically to be incredibly proficient, and they understand how to make works as paintings or sculptures, this very traditional style. Um, but several artists said to me they didn't study any kind of conceptual art until they went to Europe. That's what you've yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true, because uh, actually what you're doing here, you're doing research. You're sitting in the library, you're reading lots of magazines, you're reading lots of books, you're reading lots of critical researches, and what you do in Russia, you practice your skills. And you, you're not learning how to think, you're not learning how to relate your work to the process, because what is important here, and what is really important uh, thing that taught in, in London, is like how can you relate your practice to the like to the history of art, to the you know to the certain history, uh, historical condition that you live in, and what are you thinking of, what are you working on? It's it's you know you're not one in the world. You are connect, you're connected to you know to practice, to tradition, you to you to any other artist, and which is it's really important. Can I just ask, as an artist working in Russia, there's um, obviously a number of artist groups. I think it was Stodjelat who pulled out of exhibiting at Manifesta, and there was a few other artists who refused to be part of the program because it was a kind of state-sponsored oh, thing. I mean, do you are you concerned at the moment with the current government that there's kind of increasing censorship of the arts or um, just sort of an awareness maybe of the creativity of expression that you describe in the UK? Do you find there's a different experience in Russia? Yeah, it's really different because. Um, uh, the one, the, the one difficult for Russians to show their art here and for people here who wants to buy Russian art, it's just difficult to meet them because uh, Russian artists, they can't actually bring their art here because of all this, you know, draconian, um, draconian situation with customs and stuff. So you actually you just really, you know, it's not possible for you to make a work of art in Russia and bring it to UK or do the opposite. It's like what I'm trying to do, I'm, you know, if I have an installation, I'm just, you know, putting in a different, like in a few bags and trying to, like, you know, to, to bring it with me and it's, it's not a normal situation and um, there's no help and you always need to, you know, to be cl clever to find a way how you, you know, how you, how you want to show your work. And um, Anna, you obviously advise lots of um, clients on buying, and we've all raised this point about education of the collectors. I mean, how do you think is the best way for Russian contemporary art market to grow in terms of actually educating collectors? Because as you say, obviously if we're at school in the UK, we're taught about Damien Hirst and young British artists, and we're taught about conceptualism, but maybe that's not something that's part of the Russian education state system. So how do we actually go about educating the next generation of collectors to want to buy contemporary art? Well, unfortunately, it's a very long-term process. It doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes, even after years and years of attending museums and galleries, it still doesn't lead to buying. Because I, I can see that lots of people right now, even after trying to understand the art and being interested in it, they still don't end up buying it. So, for now, it's a very complicated issue. To, um, but I think it still, still has to be the viewings, the readings. It takes a lot of time and personal effort of a person, not only the, person who teaches you to understand art, but your personal effort on your own. So I think that's the core yes. idea. Can you also add it? 
Uh, it's kind of also about developing a certain language and certain uh, kind of respect of each other in a way, because quite often you have the situation like uh, when artists they don't really respect their collectors as you know like as personalities, as people who do things, they kind of like you kind of like yeah you kind of need their money to survive, but you don't really kind of respect their taste a lot in a way, and the uh, other way around as well, like, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, the collectors, they don't really uh, spend much, m enough time with artists, basically, you know, like, just not on business way, but just, like, you know, like, talking, meeting their families, looking, like, at their life in order to understand, like, why this art uh, is, in a way, how it comes up. Well, I think, you know, this is an interesting question, but at the same time, you need to, um, knowing the Russian scene, I know that people who have money, they must be very much interested, but not from the point of uh, at first, not from the point of a of a very um, academic point of view, but from the fun point of view, from the very like you need to get them to appreciate it. And in this term, I think Margot has a um, massive project that actually bring a lot of attention to of uh, people to look at art as a is a completely different experience because Margot whole yeah, can yeah, you yeah, tell me? explain a little bit. Um, so a few years ago we decided to organize a festival, a festival of arts and music and and it's also a masquerade. So basically because it's so difficult for example if you're um, you know if you participate in an art project and you invite people to come and see uh, you know your work or work of your friends, um, it's you know it's like maybe a hundred people will come for a night, that's the maximum. But what we decided to do, we decided to organize a festival, which is actually combining, you know, all all the people likes. Music, art, um, dressing up, party, like all the aspects which actually make people go out. And so that festival called Midsummer Night Dream, and we started in Russia, in Moscow, and we started it from the, like it was a festival for 500 people, for friends, and now it's a festival for 5,000 people. And so two years ago we launched the first one in London and we started from a small number as well, it was 300. And so this year it was 1,500 people. And what I'm doing, I'm uh, inviting artists, Russian artists and English artists, international artists, to participate in this project and to bring some um, art. Uh, it's, um, it could be, it could be um, performance art, it could be sculptures, it could be sound art, but what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make people collaborate with the, uh, in terms just uh, between the dis different disciplines. For example, musicians collaborating with artists, and artists co collaborating with the fashion designers, and that makes people, you know, uh, come mm -hmm. and enjoy art, and they actually, it's a really good response, and I think it's it's one of the ways how you can yes, you know, raise an awareness. Exactly, and that's the thing that people, I know a lot of people from Moscow who go to the event, and they would be, the first time they would be like, oh my god, this is amazing, just dress up. The next year they're going, they're actually thinking about their costume, what's going on, and like, try to get the, actually, history of, into history of art, to find a, a, someone, a different, person to, to, to dress in or something, but then when I tell them it's going to be an exhibition of Margot, uh, Margot's artworks in, in London, they're quite excited because they know what she's doing and what, what kind of art she's bringing to the world. So, I mean, this is a great connection for, for new collectors to, to pay attention or in, into art, but it's, can, it shouldn't be not in their life, it's actually their life as well, and they can be part of it. Can I just pick up on something about that? And I think contemporary art also is much more collaborative and interactive. Oh, yes. And um, if I give the example of the Manifesto, if you go into the Winter Palace, um, to be honest, you would have had absolutely no idea, I don't think, the Manifesto was on. I was the only person walking around with an orange map that I could see in the whole museum. Yes. Um, and they, Kasper Koenig, the curator, called them interventions. But actually, they weren't remotely provocative, and you probably wouldn't have even noticed. They had some um, small photographs, which are actually very interesting, which showed images of the, the great sort of galleries of the European um, classical painting, um, and they showed empty photograph frames. So you could see kind of a contemporary view, but with none of the paintings actually shown in the wall, and they were black and white photographs juxtaposed in the actual room with the real paintings um, by, say, Rembrandt or Van Dyck in the wall. But actually, it was 
very difficult to find these kind of manifesto <laughs> moments, I thought, in the Winter Palace. And I always felt that they didn't want to be provocative and they didn't want to kind of challenge the, the normal visitors, that 1.2 million who came to the Winter Palace during the time of manifesto. But actually, if we went to the General Staff Building, it was a completely different experience. And they have that incredible hall with the kind of the, the rubble building, which is kind of spilling out into the courtyard, um, which was a, a great example of a, a huge commission. And they actually had real paintings from the Hermitage Museum collection by Russian artists, which were exhibited. I don't know if you could see them, they were right at the top in this kind of huge abandoned um, building with the front facade falling off into the inside courtyard of the General Staff Building. And they had like Roma Labish paintings actually on the walls of this sort of apartment at the top of this um, installation that was built. So it was incredibly different to what you would see in the normal Hermitage building. And I think one of the things that's good about Manifesta is that actually the Hermitage 2021 project, which is what it was called when it first opened with Dmitry Ozikov, is to kind of showcase 20th century art and 21st century art. And they've now, of course, moved over some of the Sergei Shashukin and Ivan Morozov collections. So all the Matisses now, such as the music and dance, have now been moved over to the general staff. Um, but actually, contemporary art in the Hermitage, it seemed like a very odd destination to me to be holding Manifesta at the State Hermitage Museum, which didn't have any contemporary art in it, um, rather than hosting it at these other galleries. So I wonder if really the legacy of Manifesto from all of your perspectives, people who advise artists and collectors or are an artist, is actually maybe the hermitage with the, the new building of the general staff is going to become sort of the Tate Modern, if you like, for Russia, and it's going to become a hub and having these parallel events and programmes. I mean, what, what kind of events do the Rata host as sort of parallel programmes for? It's a parallel programme. We have um, a few exhibitions as well, yeah. but mostly for Russian artists. Actually, Pavel Brown was in the parallel of the classroom. But how, how important <laughs> was Manifesto for you as a contemporary institution in St. Petersburg, kind of being in Russia at the time of this major focus of contemporary Well, I mean, it, it was pretty good. It's actually a lot of people visiting Iran, mm -hmm. but because we were part of the program, because we were part of the, the, the whole body of this. But at the same time, we noticed that people um, to, when, when I talk to people, when I talk to people who came from, for Manifesto's exhibition to Rata, they say like, yes, we've been to few of those, to, only to the Hermitage one and to the to Rata, for example. They didn't go around and wonder what's going on in the parallel program, which is kind of sad. But I mean, um, we all were quite happy. It's finally contemporary art. Is, um, it was like. A, Holder of contemporary art, so like everyone praising contemporary art, and um, we do have a few negative responses. But I mean, it's it's good that we have responses. That's the main question. Well, the main issue, in my opinion. And um, you mentioned about if you're walking around in Russia and you see a piece of public art, it's still it's it quite art. unusual. Whereas we're very used to say the fourth plinth with rotating commissions and say Trafalgar Square. And um, I don't know if you all saw Francis Alice's car, which was crashed into a tree outside the front of the Winter Palace. Um, but what I loved about that example of a, an artwork was that actually the police were originally called when this car yeah, was yeah. crashed into the tree um, because people just couldn't understand yeah, why a contemporary why? artist would be called several times. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I did also read um, when I met with Casper, he said that. Actually, Manifesto was very close to being cancelled, he said, just yeah. a few weeks before, especially in light of the, the anti-gay um, propaganda legislation, which was, of course, was brought in by the St. Petersburg mayor. I just wanted to read you um, a quote from a Russian curator, Katerina Dego, just for you all to think about. And she said this about before Manifesto opened. A thing so bad that Manifesto 10 might be considered a positive, civilizational event, no matter what its content, by sheer dint of taking place in a country plummeting into the abyss of militarist aggression, obscurantism and proto-fascist nationalism. And that's a Russian curator who said that just before it opened. So very punchy, um, provocative statement. But I do wonder about the, that we have to mention the political context of what's happening in this situation. Um, and the fact that the Ukraine backdrop was happening during the, the opening manifesto as we know, some artists chose not to exhibit. I mean, you all work extensively with Russia. How much do you think that the current political context is affecting work, exhibitions, your ability as artists to exhibit abroad? Um, for example, I was in Kiev two weeks ago um, and I met with some of the top galleries in Ukraine. They've told me that they've lost over a third of their market 
they're no longer like exhibit in Russia, and they're no longer having artists and collectors flying over to Ukraine to buy works. And from my perspective, you know, they're a contemporary art gallery representing artists. They're absolutely nothing to do with what's happening on a government level and from a military perspective. So it's very sad that it's kind of the trickle down effect seems to be that the politics is now impacting on the arts. And we've seen that this week at the Russian Art Week sales and the sanctions clearly having an impact. So I wonder what you all think about that. Well, I've read the introductions to Manifesto by Petrovsky and he said that, for example, his personal point of view to this whole political situation and St. Petersburg, he considered himself uh, as a face of hermitage, as a separate entity, and he tried to have as less influence by the government and as less influence by the authorities to host this event. And uh, Kasper Kuni, who was invited to curate the manifesto, he said that he respects that for some people, uh, for some local people and for lots of Russian people, this manifesto event will be the first injection of contemporary art. So he tried to do it very subtle, he tried to install contemporary art pieces into the main building uh, very quietly and so that they don't interfere with old masters, uh, don't interfere with people's perception of art. So I think that's, that's very brave of them to proceed with the event and to try to do it very politely to invite foreign artists and let them speak and let them give let them show what they think about the whole thing. But I remember that lots of artists actually signed a petition against uh, a manifesto mm -hmm. and uh, an artist group from St. Petersburg called uh, Stodel or what to do. Uh, they uh, they signed a petition to, so that it's like if you are if you are artists you shouldn't participate in manifesto because of this uh, anti-gay uh, law propaganda and because of the political situation. And I know that there are many artists who actually signed the petition, but then um, another group of artists appeared and said that, guys, that's the only way to actually have a communication and that's the only way, you know, to say that we exist, that we are, if we, you know, if you say we are not going to participate, if we will, um, if we will be against this uh, manifesto, then at the final, we will, you know, we will just disappear, and that's the only way of communication, actually, of the civic way to talk about the problems and to, you know, to raise an awareness of what's going on. And I think in this way, especially about this uh, anti-gay law propaganda or any other questions, they're actually raising by artists and by art, and then you have this contradiction. It helps. So I don't know, but manifest. Everyone says that it was really like made in a safe way that it would be much more provocative and due to you know regulation and due to the policies it was really kind of you know tight and clean. Maybe it's provocative for Russia but it would have been less provocative in say New York yeah. <laughs> or, or London. I wanted to ask yourself around Margot, do you see a problem, is it manifestors problem or is it the Russian government's problem? Is it kind of the Russian government used Manifesto as a tool to control art in the city. They knew, like you were saying, Mark, that artists had to come to this stage to appear internationally. There were international people that travelled from Europe to go see this thing. But in a way, it was controlled by the Russian government. And if you were a, you know, an art lover like myself, to go over to Russia and wanted to see certain artists, and to be refused to see them, or to, to find out that they didn't want to um, exhibit because of Russian sanctions, would that be the same case if it was in France or Germany? Like, is, this a, is this a Russian problem? Is it a Russian government or is it a manifesto problem? That's a really interesting point which you raise about perception of Russia. And actually that was my initial thoughts before I got on the plane and went to St. Petersburg. And that really flags up for me the, the dichotomy between the reality in Russia and what you probably see on the BBC News and what you read about in the Times newspaper. And there's not necessarily a, a matching up of the, the reality on the ground. Um, so I was very concerned before I went to Russia that absolutely there was censorship of the arts, manifesto was being used as a very political pawn, if you like, um, by the Russian government. But actually having now met with the curators, having met with the artists, having seen the exhibits and the parallel events going on, I was actually quite pleased to discover that when I spoke to the artists, they said that it really did have a free reign. They were you know, able to crash the car into the tree outside the Winter Palace. They were given a huge amount of leeway, which has never been given from what I can see from a previous art events in the capital. So, um, I think it was a, a great opportunity for Russia to kind of push at the boundaries. Yes, from my perspective as a European and a Westerner, of course there is a lot more provocative things that could have been done, but I think it's 
when you think of where Russia is in comparison to say what we used to with American art or French art or British art, you know, they're still a long way behind us in terms of the contemporary art scene. So I think it was a bold step and it was a step in the right direction, but actually there's a lot more of course that can be done. So this is kind of the, the first stage of the ladder if you like, and hopefully it will kind of set the platform and build for future events. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? If I could open it up to the floor. Yes, at the back. Um, I'm curious, how is the difference in promoting exhibitions between your experience of promoting exhibitions here in sort of London and Russia itself? Because I mean, like literally, who do you use? Is it newspapers? Are there people interested in writing about shows? Or is this a non existent platform in Moscow in comparison to what is, I mean, just the Guardian itself is great. You know? mm. Newspapers generally always have at least one article on current shows. I can give you a very good example of that. Um, the, the question was about um, sort of coverage of exhibitions in Russia versus the UK. Because obviously, um, my website, Russian Art Culture, we cover global Russian culture events um, a lot in Russia and in the UK. Um, and what really struck me about um, the blog when I founded it is that actually there's not a lot of newspapers who do necessarily write about Russian newspaper, uh, Russian events, but in English. And that's the big point about our website is that we're not in Cyrillic. We're very much aimed at the international visitors. Um, and in fact, uh, Time Out in St. Petersburg contacted me and they said, you're the only ones who are kind of covering the fact that, for example, when I was in Russia in the summer, there was a major, major exhibition of Nicholas Rurik's landscape paintings at the State Russian Museum. And you would really struggle to find that covered in a single Western newspaper or any kind of coverage at all. And I remember there were, there were international visitors who were sitting using the free Wi-Fi in the Hermitage foyer and they're reading Russian art and culture in London about what event to walk to 10 minutes down the road from the Hermitage to the State Russian Museum. And for me that was like sums up the importance of actually my project and our site is that I find that shocking that actually an international visitor is having to read my site in London while they're in Russia going to a show five minutes down the road. Um, so I think the question is, like you said, about actually how do we make more artists, and you mentioned about Gargosian Gallery, um, there aren't that many maybe Russian publications who are actually interested in covering the arts in the same way that if you walk into W.H. Smith, you're going to find an absolute plethora of arts magazines, and if you're going to take modern bookshop, there are so many specialist publications. Um, and things like Art Chronica magazine, obviously was a huge print magazine, has now moved online. So there's actually some, some real challenges, I think, but for there's publishing. The art newspaper, uh, <coughs> yes, Russia, which is, which really is very good. Um, that's probably the, the one positive story yeah. I think that we could pick out. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Um, I don't really kind of promote them as Russian events, even when we're showing the Russian mm -hmm. artists. Uh, it's often like, you know, the, uh, the deal is uh, again, being Russian, working with Russians, you don't stop on the idea of identity, but you try to find uh, the subjects which can be understood as Russians, like again, speaking about the philosophy, speaking about like uh, perception yourself, like in the global world. But I don't really advertise my events like as Russian events. Uh, and then more, more the, the coverage within Russia itself, you say that to educate, to start with children, but why not start with an audience that well, may already have an interest in the arts and this lack of accessibility. Surely, uh, sort of the forefront of promotion should be to contact these magazines, these sort of companies that work with promoting just about anything within the city, and to pressure them in some way to to basically engage with some coverage of these events which are happening. They're just not spoken about. I can I just point out something about that and that really I think from well, my perspective as a Westerner that really points out the dichotomy between what I call a Russian state institution and someone like Arata which is privately owned and it's contemporary focused. So I say something like Arata is everything's bilingual, you have a very very strong social media presence, they do a lot on Facebook and Twitter, you do get lots of sort of younger people coming to your museum because you're very kind of interactive. Um, but if I go to say the State Russian Museum, they have like the worst website I've ever seen. They don't have a searchable <laughs> online collection in the English. Um, yes, I mean they have just launched a new website, a manifesto, which half the links didn't even work, um, and yeah, it has a lot to do. So I think it's a question of also you're dealing with major state institutions who maybe just don't have the kind of young curators <laughs> that you were talking about for those new galleries in Moscow who are kind of open to new ideas and using social media. I mean, what ideas do you have for how they can change? Uh, I mean, a few years ago I started sort of looking into a sort of contemporary art in Russia in general mm. and 
I was a first year student at Rome here in London University. They came to Moscow expecting to see the same amount of information available. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up in a rather large argument with a bookstore going, can I have a book on contemporary art of any shape or form? Mm -hmm. I sort of lost faith in finding anything in Russian artists. And she directed me and went, but we have my lineage. <laughs> and it was what's about contemporary and uh, she just and this is someone who, who had a huge section of art mm -hmm. books who actually had no idea what I was even trying to say to her or look for in any way um, and I think maybe to create some groups or events to educate those who are already educating not necessarily the children themselves but for actually for teachers for people who only stores, museums, to, to even have some... I can think of four, four examples who are a step in the right direction that you're talking about. Um, I think Calvert 22, we must mention, who are based in London. I think Nona Martikova has done a fantastic job of promoting Russian art, um, contemporary art in particular, and not just in St. Petersburg and Moscow, but actually cities right the way across Russia and Siberia or the Urals, or places which maybe are not covered like Perm um, or some of the other cities. And if you've seen the art guide, which is published in Russia, that's quite good, which does listings of events. And of course, you've got Vinzavod in Moscow, you've got Garage. I'd say these are kind of the, the new sites, if you like, which are becoming the promoters of contemporary art. But we need to replicate them on a much larger scale. But you know, there's a few um, projects like Door 19, which is a restaurant, but they put um, an artwork there and like pop up. And they did, it, the people came there, I know they came there because of art, not only because of food, because of art, because they knew there is a contemporary Russian artist as well as long as like international artists. Mm -hmm. So there are a few few things that are not only into like very institutional level but at the same time like for the kind of a general public. On on, on yeah. Sorry. Sorry, got another question. Yes. yes. Oh, please carry on. Oh uh, no, that's that's okay. It was just um, okay, well my question is sort of to Barbarita and to Sasha. Um, and I'm finding it quite difficult to formulate because there are lots of different elements within it. But the basic question is, how useful is this disconnect between uh, the art production and everything else? And the second part of the question is, um, if the market provided a connecting force between the art produced and the outside world, would this uh, change in some ways the art that is being produced? You mean uh, you mean the the art the art production and the connection with the outer world? Yes, I'm wondering if there are some benefits of not having an art market and what can and what can be expressed, particularly um, when things cannot be written about. Um, in response to your question, I write for the Moscow Times and the St. Petersburg Times. And of late, all of my articles have been censored. I wrote uh, about Manifesta. It was my argument was completely changed to the extent that I need to ask them to take my name off it because it's become uh, it's become quite a critical piece, and the argument's just been taken out. Um, with this removal of what is, and the BBC is not representing what's happening in Russia at all. Um, there is a complete disconnect of information, um, and I'm wondering. One, what would the function of the market be? Would that be a connecting force and how would that affect the work that's been produced? Alright, sorry to hear about that, about your <laughs> editing your work. Yeah, I think actually to be outside of Russia and making art, I definitely would say there is advantages because you are, you are free to do what you want to do and you are free to express yourself. But the point is that even if you do that, there will be no coverage in Russia. For example, two years ago, uh, I made a project that was uh, in the support of uh, Pussy Riot. It was a site-specific project in Berlin in the, uh, former, uh, in the form of women's prison. And so I've done this project and it actually had really like, you know, good response and there were lots of press from Berlin and like international press. There was no one write about this in Russia. So it's kind of, you know, it's, you, are, you are in a way disconnected if you are, you know, to making your art and if it's politically, like, politically not um, related, not really, like, not, not, not going in that direction that it's, you know, that it's supposed to be, then you will be just, you know, you'll be just unknown and no one will speak about that. 
and that's the, that's the problem. So in this way, it's better to be disconnected with Russia in making art. And I know that some artists who are in Moscow, who are based in Moscow, and they're doing really great job, and they've you know, created beautiful artworks. And for them, it's really hard to find a way how to, you know, how to show it, how to tell about what they're doing. There is a few programs. <clears throat> There's a start at Windsor, what, which is promoting Russian artists. But if you are want to, you know, want to be, if you want to be provocative and if you want to talk about current situation, probably you have not many chances to, you know, to survive and to show. People often go to you know, prison or something. Mm -hmm. So if the market yeah. might act as a connecting force, does it also have the responsibility to be a protecting force? Yeah, but there is no such thing as a market for that kind of art in Russia, unfortunately. I don't know, maybe Sasha can... Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I really understand what you're talking about uh, in the way of sort of censorship. Because as I just mentioned, uh, speaking before, uh, you always write two proposals. You just like to write two and then you somehow like, link them together, thinking about, okay, like, what would my editor think about this? And like what she would read about it and what I actually want to say and if I can ever like develop, you know, like this a bit punk approach, you develop this secret language which uh, you in your like underground parties, like you deliver like this kind of the knowledge of this language to your visitors, to your audience, you build your audience and then like uh, you kind of shift your message like into the proposal, you deliver it to the government uh, institution like who is going to pay for that to make it. This is kind of like then you come to the exhibition and they're like, you know what I mean. Right? I have a really funny example of what's going on. A few years ago, I had a project. It was a rainbow. It was like a shimmering rainbow in a night sky. It was a site-specific installation, and I proposed it for um, uh, the uh, as a public as a public art event for the museum night in Moscow two years ago. And at the beginning, like everyone was hands up for that, and it was like you know going really well. But then suddenly, a curator, she came to me and said, you know what, yeah, that one. And she said, you know what, we can't do this. And I said, why? And I said, because it's a rainbow and it symbolizes LGBT. And I said, what's the hell? It's like, you know, it's uh, the people trying to really rethink like a simple things and to find their, like, um, to find the different senses and to, to find the different meanings of uh, the artwork. So basically everything is in, in, a, in a not like right way, in a strange But I think it's a bit more of a, of a people perception of government uh, it's, it's, it's laws. It's just tells you know, about their, yeah, yeah, about their problems. Yeah, exactly. It's not about, uh, okay, government do these laws and like issue those laws, but Russians always go to the extreme. They say like, no, there's no way. Rather than, it's probably be absolutely fine. And no one would care about this. But they're so scared to, to do those things, like they go really on extreme. Saying like, no, straight away. And um, I was really struck by the audience member's comments about censorship in Russia, because um, I'm obviously a British journalist, but I also write for Russia Beyond Headlines. And I've actually never been censored and never had any of my articles and that's published by a state Russian newspaper, and I've not shied away from writing about the political situation, so I'd be interested to talk to you afterwards. Um, but also, that raises a really valid point about censorship in Russia, and I know that the, um, the government changed the law recently. Is it? I think it's a blog now, if it has over 5,000 readers, has to be reported to the Russian government. Um, so obviously, Russian art and culture, we would fit into that, and obviously we cover Pussy Riot coming to the UK last week, and other things which might be deemed politically sensitive. And I'm very conscious of the fact that you know our server is in the UK, so I can't be shut down by the Russian government. But it does make me wonder if my blog was in St. Petersburg or in Moscow, would actually Russian art and culture exist as a project? So maybe on that note, we should think about uh, the legacy of contemporary art and just think about actually events like today are so important because actually having a discussion, having a platform for dialogue, that in my view is exactly what culture is about. And I think that what we've seen today from all the speakers is that in my view, I think culture really does transcend politics and is something which is a kind of platform for collaboration and for discussion. So thank you all very much for coming. I'm conscious of the time, so I think we'll wrap up there. Um, but I believe this video will be on YouTube, so do send it on to friends, and uh, it'll be on RussianArtAndCulture.com shortly later this week. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for coming.